Girls with Goals, brought to you by Neutrogena Hydro Boost Capsule and Serum Supercharge Booster. It's weightless and instantly hydrates your skin. Hello and welcome to Girls with Goals. I'm Neve Marr. The show this week is brought to you by Neutrogena. We have a fantastic competition running on our site with thanks to Neutrogena. So we want to help you reach your goals and we have a 5,000 euro prize for the lucky winner. So do head over to her.ie and you can get more details on that. But now, down to business. I'm delighted to welcome my guest this week, Remy Naidu, to the show. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. I feel very privileged that I'm the only person sat on this yes. One on one. <laughs> one on one. Intense. Always. Let's get deep. Um, so we're going to start off with our game. So it's called Six Words or Less. And it's for any of our listeners and readers of her or viewers of the show now as well who may not know who you are. Okay. So you have to describe yourself in six words or less. So in your own time. Okay, I was thinking hard about this. Yeah. And I'm trying to overthink it. But I think for me, um, I have my fingers and toes dipped in many different things. I have so many different interests, so I'm just gonna go with a woman who has many interests. Nice. Yeah, I love simple. It when, I love it when people <laughs> do sentences because a lot of word descriptions come out in that game, and I love yes. when a sentence is used. Yes. So, so it's awesome. a perfect segue as well to kind of talk about your interests and your career and everything like that, but yeah. I suppose I wanna go back a little bit first and find out, because like you said, you do have so many interests and you do have your finger in all the pots. So when you were growing up, did you have like one clear career path that you wanted to go down? Not really, no. I remember when I was really, really tiny, about three or four, I my uh, parents brought me to Paris and the very first job that I wanted to be was a yo-yo seller on the River Seine. I saw these guys with these like light up yo-yos and I was like, that's my dream job. I don't think that's a job, Remy. I don't think it is a job. That's what that was my dream for such a long time. And uh, a yo-yo seller. A yo-yo seller that died quite quickly. Um, (laughs) And then, yeah, I suppose I did Latin and ballroom dancing when I was younger. So I always, the dancing was the first thing that kind of started. Yeah. Um, And then I got a karaoke machine for Christmas when I was about six or seven and then that's kind of how the singing started so I guess I always had stars in my eyes as a kid I didn't really know what I wanted to do though kind of what career path I wanted to go down but then as as everything as I got older it kind of forged itself yeah (laughs) but it was definitely like kind of the entertainment industry was something that appealed to you yes yeah I think and it came more prominent when I got into school and there was the musicals and all mm. that kind of thing and um, I, st- I did drama, I started drama when I was about eight so being on stage and yeah as I got older and the CAO started looming I yeah. was going I, I, I'm not really a person who'd you know I don't want to do law medicine or you know I think the entertainment kind of buzz was my thing so yeah. I studied music in college and then kind of Dabbled, dabbled in, I've dabbled in lots of things my whole life. Yeah. I've never had one thing. I've always had so many different hobbies. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I always find it kind of interesting when people like go into the entertainment industry and the reaction from their families to it. So like, were your family very much like, absolutely, like obviously, you know, they, they bought you a karaoke machine. So, <laughs> so they, you know, I mean, they kind of, they planted the seeds essentially yes. themselves. Um, but I do think as well, like like that, when you say about the CAO and stuff, it is the time when, you know, parents are kind of thinking about, okay, well, you know, long term, what mm. is my kid going to do like for a profession? And do they ever kind of encourage you to maybe go like more of a, a stable career path or were they very supportive and knew that you wanted to do something in the arts? Uh, they were incredibly supportive and mm. I was so, so lucky and I'm so lucky. I mean, looking back now, you really appreciate it. At the time you appreciate it, but I mean, God, the ferrying to and from drama classes, yeah. singing, I mean, these 15 years of their life were just spent and three kids as well, you know, it's mm. a really, really tough job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were always really, really supportive. They knew that I wanted to be on stage or whatever it was or singing or so yeah when the CAO came they were saying it was either this or drama and trinity yeah. so um yeah they're super supportive and they said just go for it so and yeah, music okay. so you studied music in college yes. so that was kind of you know you almost like choosing music as much as you can when you're like 17 18 years of age and being like okay so this is what I want to do so you wanted to go and get a degree though was that really important to you as opposed to just going and kind of starting to essentially book gigs yes I I suppose with the music it was music theory and training my voice even though I'd had singing lessons and it was a different type of course so it was Mm. commercial modern music so every week 
in my vocal stream would be doing reggae, like opera, like mad things that you'd never yeah. get to do otherwise. So I suppose that's why I picked it. And with drama, I was scared that when I finished the drama degree, all you could ever be was an actor and that was it. Yeah. So with the music, I was kind of thinking, okay, if I don't want to be a singer at the end of it, there's A&R, there's music publishing, there's all these kind of different things that you can go into. So I kind of felt it was a little bit of a safer choice rather than this, <laughs> this straight yeah. drama. Um, but I think everyone going in there was like, I want to be a pop star. And then at the end of the four years, it was quite clear that that just wasn't going to Is there <laughs> is there a lot of that? Is there a lot of like pop star potentials in like a course like that? Because honestly, I'm picturing fame. <laughs> this is what everyone like says. I'm, I'm picturing yes. people walking down the college corridors with a trombone and then everyone just starts going, oh yeah. I mean, and then they just like a ballet dancer flies through the air and stuff like that. Absolutely not. No, no. you wouldn't no. believe how many people have said that to me over the years. Like your college is like fame, people like stretching in the, the, the you know, the hallways. So I'm like, no, it's not like that. People in BIM are very cool. I went to BIM. Yeah. Um, they're very cool. And you have the different streams. So it's bass, songwriting, drums, mm. uh, vocals and guitar. Right. So um, everyone is kind of in their different groups. But no, it was, it, it's, it's nothing like fame whatsoever. I think, and also the pop star thing was bashed out, I think. Really? First term, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, we were kind of taught if you're doing this course, you're not in it to be a pop star. You're here to hone your songwriting skills. You're here yeah. to, you know, teach, train your voice, how to do different things. Mm. If you want to be a pop star, this isn't the course for you. <laughs> so that, that's great. And I mean, does it equip you then in terms of like going out and getting a job in the music industry as well? Because like I would imagine that that is incredibly daunting. I know, like I studied journalism and uh, like kind of towards the end of my degree there's placement and that was always really crucial because not only do you make incredible connections with people when you're out like working as an intern essentially but also you know I mean journalism and stuff like that is so hard to get into and you yes. don't when you're a college student like as hard as you try you don't have any connections with people like you just don't so it's cold calling you know yes um so I always remember being so grateful and that's actually what got me my first job as well mm. so do they do they did that like did they do that for you in any way they encouraged us. It wasn't a part of our course, but mm. they did say, you know, if you want to go and do placements, you'd kind of have to arrange them and do them right. yourself. So uh, two very good friends of mine went to New York for the summers and they did a and um, you know, internships there. Yeah. And one of them then started working in New York and he's doing amazingly nice. He's moved back to London. But um, yeah, it's, it's a case of it, it, it wasn't kind of given to you, you had to go out and do yeah. it yourself. But a lot of my friends, and myself included, we sang in wedding bands, bands during college yeah. to kind of make a bit of extra money. So especially the singers, I think we were all kind of like, after college, that's how we'll make our first bit of money, yeah. you know, and during college as well for pocket money. So, but yeah, internships are definitely the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So you finished the degree then, what was next? What was, what was the thing that kind of, because obviously, you know, I've, I've seen other interviews that you've done and stuff and, you worked on the six o'clock show, right? So yes, was that kind of the neck or the first thing that you did after college? Uh, what it was actually, well, yeah, I finished college and I took a few weeks just to kind of process in my mind what I was going to do. Yeah. And then, yeah, I graduated in the November and I very quickly started the internship in the six o'clock show and that came through. Um, I did The Voice of Ireland a few years ago. Yes. And Anthony Nyland, who was um, the producer of the show, is was then working at Virgin Media, so I got in contact with him and I said, is there any production runner shifts going? Mm. I really, because I'd finished the music degree and I had been doing, I did, I put on my own jazz gigs um, after college as well um, in the Whale Theatre in Greystones. Mm -hmm. So I did about five or six of them and it was myself and a five piece band and it was about 20 set song list. Yeah. And I was doing that and I loved it. But I, I love it, but I was just going, I don't think music will always be a part of me and I'd love it to be part of my career, but I never saw it as a full career for yeah. me. So then I was going, what else do I love to do? I love acting, but I'm, I just, I think then I saw presenting and I said, oh, I think I might be good at that. Sure, I'll try and get in somewhere and because I know that's how internships and production runner, yeah. uh, you know, that's how you get into the... The places. So yeah, I did the six month internship on the six o'clock show, which taught me so much about yeah. live television and the way a TV show works. And it was a brilliant starting point for me to just learn about television because yeah. I'd never done anything before that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was like being thrown into a fire pit, but in the most amazing way. <laughs> yeah. Was it like nothing like you expected? It wasn't like anything I expected. Mm. No, it was it was hard work. And I mean, 
but you have to you have to be willing to do you know clean out the slop bucket and make cheese and coffees and I I enjoy doing that mm. and it, you have to I think a lot of people think you just kind of waltz into these places and get a job it's not like that you know you have yeah. to you have to put the work in <laughs> absolutely I mean I think it's a really kind of important thing to to talk about as well and yes. to, to hammer home that like yeah. you do have to kind of do those kind of like work I mean I did that as well I was making teas and coffees mm. you know for for a year like it felt like years yes. I don't know if it actually was years but yeah. in my mind I was built it up to be like years because it's not obviously the work that you want to do but it's important to also show the people that you're willing to put the work in I think absolutely I think it's also important to you know say that the grind never stops like mm. I'm constantly still trying to find what's next new yeah. jobs you know I think people especially all of my friends who and social media plays such a big role in it as well you put up a picture and everyone's going you're so busy with work you're doing so much yeah. and it's you know then I go oh well like Instagram makes you look like you, you know you can be a lot busier than you yeah. are um but yeah I think that it, the, the grind never never stops you always have to be on the lookout for what's next and especially in this industry yeah. as well there's so many people trying to make it. You have to you have to keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so, like, when you were working there then as a runner, um, tell me how the Eurovision kind of mm. came about. So that was, like, almost towards the end of that, was yeah, it? Yeah, it was the end. So it was April, May time, and they wanted Ryan O'Shaughnessy on the show. And I yeah. heard that I was do, doing my bits in the office, and I heard them go, oh, well, let's get Ryan on. I said, oh, I know Ryan. He was in BIM, like, three years ahead yeah. of me. And they were like, oh, you get in touch with him there and you ask him, does he want to come on the show? So I was like, OK. So I texted him and said, hi, Ryan, working for the Six O'Clock Show now. Uh, they'd mm -hmm. love to have you on. Can I pass your number on to the producers? And he's going, yeah, absolutely. And then he said, oh, by the way, I'm actually auditioning backing vocalists to go to Eurovision. Do you want to audition? Mm. I was going, sure, why not? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I auditioned and he said we'd love to have you on the team. So within the space of, I think, two weeks, I was in rehearsals in RT, heading off to the Eurovision, which was the most manic bizarre and wonderful experience I've ever had it was what is it like I've never like obviously I watch it everybody watches it it's one of those like things that's just very much a part of our culture I think even yes. though Ireland hasn't done the best yes. in the last kind of few years um but what was it like to actually be there like is it manic it's manic and when you're on the stage in the arena I think it's Correct me if I'm wrong now. Some, some people in the watching they're like, wrong, but I think it's the second. The final is the second largest um, program watched after the World Cup final. So Crazy. two over two hundred million people tune in to watch it. So you're on yeah. that stage, and of course we made just the final with Ryan. Yeah. So you're on the stage, going, "Oh my God, two hundred million people are watching us right now. It's yeah. insane." But the buzz. I was in Lisbon last year, mm. so I'd never been. Beautiful city, but I mean, Eurovision fans are hardcore. They really are. They are so hardcore. I mean, camping outside the. We We'd arrive at the arena for rehearsals around two o'clock and they'd be going, Ryan, Ryan, he'd be going signing autographs and he'd be going, oh, you know, we, I would ask them, how long have we been here? Six, six a.m. this morning, camping out. It's like, what? who are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't arrive till two. Um, so yeah, they're, they're proper hardcore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I suppose like backing vocals, you know, would probably like pay the bills a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I watched a really interesting documentary and it was called, I don't know if you've seen it, but it was 20 feet from stardom. I've been meaning to watch it. Oh I haven't. So but yes, I good. it's so to. interesting. Like, mm. and it's just about backing vocalists, like through the years, I suppose, like really infamous people and infamous voices that you don't even realize that you know, but yes. they're like on the Rolling Stones tracks, like they're on the Beatles tracks, and you don't even are you don't even know that you're listening to them. Yes. And then like to see them be interviewed and stuff like that was was so incredible. Um. And it made me kind of think about backing vocalists a little bit more. Like, is, is every backing vocalist essentially, like, trying to be there in the front themselves, would you say? I would say so, yeah. yes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of singers, up-and-coming singers that you'd see, you'd see, oh, they were backing vocalists for a lot of, you know, Liam Havas or artists yeah. like this. And then, I mean, you'd go to a gig and the artist would go, and here's my, you know, backing vocalist going to do a solo. And you'd hear them singing and you'd go, well, you should be up at the front. So yes, I think yeah. there is an element of a lot of backing vocalists kind of try to get on tour with, uh, you know, a big name and then mm. try and kind of make it for themselves. But I'd say the experience is invaluable as well. Like even absolutely. that, like even being there live to like however many million of people like watching you. Yes. I'd say that, you know, do you, you never suffer from or have ever suffered from stage fright? No, I haven't actually. I've been very lucky. Um, I think doing drama from such a young age, I did all the feshes. Yeah. So I think that kind of um, taught me 
not not to get I've, I always get nervous but I never have never been on stage where I'd always dream about I guess forgetting words or something mm, like that but the no, nightmare I, nightmare absolute nightmare but I know yeah. I've never suffered from it luckily um so that yeah I've been quite lucky with so that. it's more like anticipation rather than actual like nerves that would affect your performance yes yeah yes. so while you're there at Eurovision it, it kind of you know things were were obviously happening for you because it was kind of how you got involved in Expose as well. Mm, yeah. So you did like an Instagram takeover type thing while you were there. So how did that come about? So um, one of the lovely team on the Six O'Clock Show, you just kind of get to know all yeah. them, but he'd moved over to Expose. So I suppose that was helping itself, the lovely Dan. Um, but yeah, I think he, it was kind of known in the building that I was going to the Eurovision. So mm. that kind of helped, I guess. But yeah, at the Expose, the whole team just said, would you got in touch and said, would you mind taking over our social media pages? It's the first time Ireland's gone into Thwana, however many yeah. years. Um, love to see some back scene stuff. So yeah, I did that. And then when I got home, I got, was asked for in for a screen test and that kind of was that. <laughs> what was that like? Like, I mean, obviously that I'd say would be like a nerve wracking type situation in terms of Expose is just so well known. Yes. And obviously like all of the presenters are really established and like full blown celebs in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been on the air for such a long time, yeah. over 10 years. 12 years. 12 now, years, yeah. 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 Um, so you must have felt a little bit of nerves before that or were you just like gonna smash this one? Oh no, I was, I was mad nervous, especially because I knew that you know, I love fashion and then Expose was the one program in the building that I would love to, to be yeah. on, you know. So, and I hadn't heard anything and it was getting close to the time and I said, oh, do you know what, if they if they text and ask, I'm just going to focus on the final, I'll just say, no, 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 sorry. And then the, t the text came in and the whole table were just like, Remy, you're doing it. And they mm. were like, we became such a little family by the end of it. And I was yeah. going, no, I'm too nervous, I'm too nervous. And Kieran, our choreographer, was just like, this person here, this person here, I'm going to, I'm going to, one, two, three, go, you're going to do it. I was like, ah, okay. I, I was so nervous, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just banged out maybe six of them and just sent them over. Um, but yeah, I was incredibly nervous. It wasn't a case of like, okay, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. how did you feel then when you kind of got the call and they said that they wanted you to be front of camera? Ecstatic. I remember I arrived home, I think I'd been home a couple of days, I was having a cup of tea with mum. And um, Debbie texted me, Debbie O'Donnell, and mm. she was like, oh, when are you home? I said, oh, I'm home now. She said, would you, love, would you like to come in and screen test for our um, Showbiz Minute, which is their 60-second um, Showbiz um, little video that they put up on social media. Yeah. I just screamed in the kitchen. I was like, yes, yes, of course. And my mum was like, oh, no, I'm going to cry. <laughs> oh, my God, that's yeah. lovely. I mean, because it's, it's really hard to in this industry to even get a, a break. So that was, yeah. it was an amazing foot in the door. So I was ecstatic and then... Thankfully, I did a good enough job. They wanted me to come back. Yeah. <laughs> so him. And in terms of like actually working on the show, um, I've said it before, and I've had like Cassie on on the show before. She's amazing. But like some of the hardest working people, I would say in in entertainment, like they do so much on a day to day basis. Like even just following them on Instagram makes me tired. Like they're go they're constantly going to different shoots, and then I know as well that they do actually do a huge amount of the editing and packages mm. and scripting themselves too. Yes. Which I don't know whether a lot of people know because I feel like sometimes people think with presenters, you know, that like, oh, they've got the most glamorous job in the world. They get to be on camera, mm. hair, makeup, and then they just toddle off home. It's like, not yeah. at all, right? So tell us a little bit about the ins and outs of working on Expose. This is, yeah, this is something that I did want to mention because I am a culprit, even before I learned anything about TV, I'm like, ah, oh, sure, they just turn up, read the auto cue, go home, it's grand, yeah. handy, easy. No, that's not the case. Um, you could be doing either one shoot or a full day shoot, but if you're on a full day, it's back to back shoots. You could be going from the other side of town over north, south, wherever. Um, and then, yeah, they, they were teaching me how to edit, which is amazing, because yeah. I had no experience in that whatsoever. So I can now, do qu quite basic editing on Avid, which mm. is a huge skill to have. And yeah. anyone that would want to get into media, I'd say editing is Learn a it. key, yeah. yeah, a key skill. But um, because it can take you anywhere. But yeah, so it's literally yeah that the, the VO like they'll be scripting. It's just it's, it's it the work. The women just, I don't think they get enough credit for the amount of work that they do. Because you read articles about the girls and like, oh, the expose it girl is so glamorous. And mm. I think they get a lot of stick. And it's like, no, you yeah. don't know how hard they work. And even I was on um, 
a press trip. Uh, I visited, visited the Emmerdale set back mm. in the UK and one of the guys said, oh, you're from Dublin. I worked for the Irish Mirror um, back in the day. What uh, channel are you with at Expose? And he was like, ah, the hardest working girls uh, on TV. And I said, yeah. you know that? And he said, yeah, I do. When I got over, uh, you know, I kind of saw them as the glamorous girls. But then when, when you t talk to people and hear how hard yeah. that they work, and I was like, well, I'm glad that you know that. It's good. <laughs> I think it's becoming more like common knowledge now. Mm. But I, d I don't think that they, like maybe they were, I don't know whether they would have been told not to like shout about it, but you you know, for a while, I think it was because they didn't necessarily talk about how much work that they actually put into it themselves as well. And yes. so I think people presumed that they were just like the talent front of camera and then that was it, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really good like that it's becoming a bit more common knowledge, you know, and people and Cassie, I think, has really like opened it up for people like with her social media. Yes. So people can really see like the amount of stuff that she's doing, which is yeah, you'd get tired watching it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um. So that's incredible to hear. Then, so you are back and forth though, because you're based in London now, right? Yes. Now tell me about this, because obviously, you know, if your career, like, I suppose it's all about banging down the doors, as you've said before. Yes. So you know, opportunities are opening up here in Ireland. But do you think that there's more opportunity in terms of presenting? in London? Yes, I do. I I made the brave move over because I've been working with Expose obviously the past year and I'm still doing bits mm. of them, but I just felt that I'm 25, I wanted to move away from home for a while and I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. Yeah. Be brave and go because you get too comfortable here and I, I just wouldn't go. And I, I, do, I do want to broaden my horizon a little bit and I'd love to make a name for myself in the UK, whether that happens or not, who knows. Um, yeah. But... I said, if I don't try, I'll never know. So yeah, I've, I moved over four months ago and there is there is more opportunity there. There's more TV stations, mm. there's more things being made, more production companies, it's just a bigger city. Yeah. So um, obviously that means more people are trying to you know get into it over there. But um, I mean, the year in Exposé has stood me in, like amazingly well and yeah. I've learned so, so much and I'm continuing to learn. That's the beauty of it, you know, yeah. um, I'm always learning on the job yeah <laughs> but yeah absolutely definitely a lot more opportunity over there I'd say is it daunting to be in such a massive city because London is like sometimes I, I go over there quite a bit and I do still get affected sometimes by just the sheer volume yeah and it's such a cliche thing to say like oh we're from Ireland we're a small country blah 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 but like you know it does like it it can get to me a little bit at times even just the amount of people that are there. Yes. So is it daunting from a professional standpoint though? Like you said earlier, there's a lot more people who are trying to make it. Yes. Um, and like, how would you even, or what have you learned over the last four months even? Cause it's a really short you know, amount of time. What mm -hmm. have you learned so far that maybe you would pass on to other people who are thinking about making that move? So what would I pass on? I spent probably the first two months, nine to five, emailing, 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 with getting very few responses back. And you can take it to heart. And I was getting so disheartened. And I've I've very luckily moved over with my boyfriend. So yeah. it wasn't as scary as right. moving over by myself. Um, so we moved over together. But he's an actor as well. so And he had been in a play. So he was working and I was doing a few bits for Expose. But then just trying to knock down doors. Yeah. found it very disheartening. But you have to give yourself a chat. Like, I gave myself a talking to. I said, Remy, you're being so hard on yourself. You've been here yeah. like eight weeks. Come on, cop on. You yeah. know, people are there two, three years before they get their first break. Yeah. And you have to be willing to just put in that time. But um, I had a screen test for something the other day, which I'm not going to say anything about because I don't get it. But um, that was just through, I was emailing agents. She'd come back to me and said, really sorry, I can't take anyone on. This yeah. was just as I'd gotten to London, maybe two weeks. And I got an email from her about a couple of weeks ago saying, oh, I'm, I know of a TV station looking for a presenter for something. I had you in mind. Would you like to go for it? And I said, absolutely. And that was just by chance, four months later, I mean, such a long period of time, mm. but it was a glimmer of hope for me to say all this emailing isn't, it, it's not going unnoticed by someone, yeah. you know, even if your email is four months back, hopefully you've made an impression or you, that they'll remember you. Yeah. So that was really nice to know that she'd remembered me. So that was like a glimmer of hope. So what I say to people is just don't be disheartened by it. You just have to yeah. keep going. And even for me now, I'll head back this evening. Tomorrow I'll be straight back into it. But it's kind of mentality that you have to have, I guess. But yeah. there is definitely a lot more opportunity over there, I'd say. And what would be the 
like dream job for you? What's the kind of pinnacle if we were just to talk about presenting? Because I, I feel like presenting seems to definitely be your passion at the moment. But like you said, like you, you're multi-talented <laughs> and you do have a lot of other interests. And mm. I want to talk a little bit about acting and stuff too. Um, but yeah, what would be like the dream gig for you? So I, I'd mentioned previously that I had done that and, and ballroom dancing, so Strictly Come Dancing. Would that be it? Oh. I would love to host Strictly Come Dancing. I'd, I just think it's, I've been addicted to it since I was nine years old, like yeah. I'm watching it. Failing that, I feel I also grew up watching um, T4, you know, with Jamila oh, yeah. Jamil, that mm -hmm. kind of, I'd, like, or music related show, but I suppose if you're looking, at the big, the big show, Strictly, is probably the yeah. one that I'd love to present. That's yeah. an, it's a good goal to have. It's a good goal. It's a good goal, Maybe yeah. contestant first and then presenter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I do find it so interesting when you look at, like, the big presenters, you know, like the Ant, Ant or Deck, mm. Ant or Deck. Um, and I, I do think it's funny to see their career paths and, like, how they've kind of gone. Like, a lot of them, you know, were in acting and were in other elements of the entertainment business yeah. first before moving into it. Um, do you think there should be more kind of like presenter driven courses for people? Like even in Ireland, you know what I mean? Because I do feel like people kind of fall into it. Like I studied, you know, journalism and then I went into radio and that's how I got into broadcasting. Mm. But it wasn't like, you know, I was a 10 year old girl being like, I want to be a presenter in front of a camera, you know? Like, do you think that there's opportunities there to actually have more courses that are focused on the skill of presenting? I do and I don't. I feel like, as you did, you did journalism, a lot of people start behind the camera before yeah. they ever get in front of it. Um, so, and I would love to do more for the production element because I yeah. think it really, really helps as it, when you get in front of the camera, you know, angles. I mean, Karen Coster of Expose and the cameraman have always said it, she just knows her stuff, you know, she'll get into play, she'll know the angles, and that's because she spent years, uh, you know, on Ireland AM as a researcher, and then yeah. she was um, in production. So, I mean, that has st stood her, and she's, I, she's a fantastic presenter, yeah. and I think that's why she has all that background information. Um, yeah. But I don't know, I feel like you have to do either get into the building. I mean, I was incredibly lucky the way it happened for me, but I probably would have had to do more of the production stuff if the yeah. exposure thing hadn't happened, and I would have been happy to do that. Yeah. I still want to do it because I feel like you learn a lot. Yeah. But um, I feel like the presenter courses... No, I, I, I feel like you should get work experience working behind the scenes yeah. before you get into the camera. Because the thing as well is that sometimes it's, it's not a good thing to be to presenter E yes. as well. Yeah. Like that's the thing, like, you know, people do the little, like this little thing, I know, yeah. like <laughs> people who are listening don't understand what I'm doing, but I'm just jiggling a little bit. But it's kind of like the presenter swing. Yes. And people like who are in the industry like know about it and kind of talk about it as well. Yes. So I think that there can be that element of, you know, being too robotic and being too, almost too rehearsed because mm. at the end of it like you, it does you do just want it to be a conversation I that's what I always aim for anyway yes and I absolutely. think that like you know you don't want it to ever feel forced or like too presentery that's not a word no no <laughs> and, and I completely agree and I think the presenter courses might encourage yeah. that kind of Ah, <laughs> yeah. jazz hands. Jazz hands, yes. Um, a lot of yeah, a lot of you just have to be good at talking to people. Like, yeah. I guess is the main thing about a presenter. So yeah, I'd I definitely stick to kind of working your way up. Rather, yeah. I don't think the courses really help to be honest, unless they taught you in the courses editing and the production elements which behind they probably, the scenes. Yeah, and, yeah, which they might do. It's so crucial to have those as well. Yeah. Um. So I want to talk to you quickly just about you know acting and music as well because mm -hmm. obviously like you're in London now. So are those elements that you are still pursuing or like if a huge acting role came, would that be it for you or is, is acting kind of something that you're I'm even that interested in? Yes, I'm still pursuing that um, as well. I've joined an agency over there. It's more commercials, but yeah. they do acting as well. So yeah, I, if an acting role came up, I was actually on the plane over here this morning. Uh, this morning I was reading the car magazine at Erlingus and Ashling B was on the front. Oh, yeah. And I mean she's a comedian, but she's doing a lot more acting now yeah. than she is. Um so I feel I feel she's like an incredible writer as well. Yeah, she's mm. amazing. She's she's brilliant. But um 
is re yeah, reading about the new Netflix show that she has coming out. But yeah, she's kind of an example of someone who's kind of doing the two at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, if an acting gig came up, I'd 100% take it. And Laura Whitmore as well. She's she's kind of started as an actor yeah. before the presenting or radio ever um, came about. She's done so, great stuff in theatre as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. So she'd be another one to say, I think, yeah, I think you can do both. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that I'll be able to do both. And singing as well is something I still love to do. So... Um, I haven't made it easy for myself. <laughs> You're just too I damn I talented oh, no, and too I, many things. <laughs> I wish I had just one hobby. I think it will make it easier. <laughs> but I think when you're a creative person, though, it, it does happen, though, that mm. you do tend to be drawn to different things. Yes. And I think as well, like, you can get itchy feet, so you, you don't necessarily want to be doing one thing for too long. I was about to say that. I'd probably get bored if I was doing one thing for yeah. that amount of time. So I do enjoy the fact that I, I do have different hobbies and things that I like to do because yeah. it makes it a little bit more interesting. Absolutely. Mm. Um, well, Remy, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Best of luck in London and best of luck in everything that you do. I, I love, like, I watch the girls that you were mentioning there, like a few of them, Angela as well, Angela Scanlon, yeah. she's been on the show and uh, they're doing incredible things over there. And I like the, the fact that it does feel like it's a nice Irish community of women doing incredible things in London. Yes, um, I agree. And I see that they go, now I never, I don't know whether it's like, oh, I can't think of the name of the building now, but it's like, it's an Irish, it's not the consulate, but it's somewhere that they go anyway. A lot of them give talks there. A lot of them like engage with the community. Yes, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, which I think is really nice to see as well, so. It's brilliant. I, what you were saying earlier about London being daunting, I, I think that within an hour of, I've, arriving I heard an Irish accent and I was like oh I'm home there's yeah, so many Irish so over many, there yeah. that you never really feel like you're far away from home I'm sure it's only an hour on the plane anyway so. yeah absolutely <laughs> well Remy thank you so much for coming in and everybody go and follow Remy on all of her social media and watch out for singing acting <laughs> presenting <laughs> all of the all of the things that she'll be doing so well so it's been an absolute pleasure thank you Neve, for having me thanks a lot. <laughs>